Now, I think that this is a very powerful planet and of powerful influence over our solar system. I know that Saturn is the sixth planet. We all know that. But if you count the moon, which we don't normally count the moons of the planets, but when it comes to our Earth and looking from our point of view, the moon is important, our moon and sun. So would that not give us the number seven for Saturn? And that sounds pretty accurate to me. That sounds like the right number for Saturn. Although, you know, I could be wrong because it's the sixth planet and it has the hexagram on its north pole, right? So six. Linking it to the 666 and to the number of the beast, right? The six-sided diadem. Now, we know the Hebrews have a six-pointed star. And could that six-pointed star be a direct reference to Saturn? So, I wanted to speak on Saturn and its connection to the green. This green color of Saturn is amazing. I hadn't seen many images like this previously. I'm really struck by this. Just beautiful imagery. I realize it's probably all AI created, but <clears throat> had you ever seen Saturn looking quite like this? Pretty epic, right? Yeah, I really like these images. So, um, you know what else it reminds me of? You know, when I think about how uh, musicians are so focused, so many musicians seem to have the focus on uh, Saturn as though uh, this is the one that you need to go to if you want to make some kind of a deal. And it could be because, you know, it looks like the disc of a record spinning round and round and round, right, on a turntable. And isn't it interesting that he's called Saturn? Saturn. Sat being the root of Satyr, the Satyr, right? which is one of the devil representations. And of course, Saturn is the representative of Capricorn, the devil goat fish, right? The goat fish devil that we're all familiar with. But Saturn is also the representation of uh, Aquarius. So there's there's been some contention. I've heard people speak on this topic saying that Saturn is different in the age of Aquarius and that uh, maybe because Uranus is thought to be present as well that this will change the nature of Saturn uh, to where it won't be such a, a harsh teacher. I wonder, I wonder. These are all theories, right? Who really knows the truth of these things? <clears throat> I think that a lot of the times when we see men's hats, they're representing Saturn. To put one's head through this hole, it's almost like you see it in, in imaged in sci-fi, you'll see a head, a floating head that appears to be decapitated, right? Let's say a decapitated head, the head of John the Baptist, say. That's interesting because then you've got the Jesus connection. And I contend that there's a connection from Jesus to Saturn. I've, ex I've explained it in my recent videos as far as I understand it. I'm only expressing my own opinion, of course, but I don't think I'm alone in it. It's just that the uh, head on a plate or the head on a platter that puts me in mind of the Bible story of John the Baptist beheading, right? For the girl Herodotus or Herodotus. Hmm. What do you think? John the Baptist, the god of rain, perhaps? The god of the sky, the sky god? See, now we're getting somewhere where we can actually look at these Bible stories and give them some genuine meaning. Assigned to them from the true origin religions of paganism. Esoteric secrets these days because nobody's supposed to be pagan. 
so we think. Doesn't matter how many saints you pray to, that's not pagan. <laughs> well, yeah. So anyway, the head of John the Baptist, isn't that an interesting concept? Old father time. And then, of course, Jesus would represent the new, the child of the new year, as we often see him presented, right? The little child of the new year. So you've got the old one and the new one. Hmm. Well, let's take a look at some of these concepts. The green man, I thought, could that possibly, you know, could that possibly be talking about Saturn? Now we know the green man is associated to the earth because it's tr it's in the trees. He's in the trees, right? The green man is primarily interpreted as a symbol of rebirth, representing the cycle of new growth that occurs every spring. The green man motif has motif has many variations. Branches or vines may sprout from his mouth. Often related to natural vegetation deities. Uh, the shoots may bear flowers or fruits. So one of the terms for this character in one of the parts of the world is Robigo. Do you know who that is? Robigus or Robigo. Hmm, let's see if I can... It doesn't pop up there because some business has stolen the name. Here we go. Here's one way to find it, because you have to go to the, rust, the rustic Roman calendar. Robigalia. The Robigalia was a festival in ancient Roman religion held April 25th. So we're still talking. Every day we're going to keep talking about April. Okay, one way or another, I'm going to keep referring you to that girl in the I Pet Goat video who represents April with her apple. And April is Avril open an open book an open door the opening of the spring april named for the god robigus its main ritual was a dog sacrifice to protect the grain fields from disease in these games the ludi in the form of major and minor races were were held the Robigalia is one of several of these agricultural festivals in April to celebrate and vitalize the growing season. But the darker sacrificial elements of these occasions are also fraught with anxiety. Anxiety because of fear <laughs> that you might be killed? Possibly. But here it says just crop failure. The anxiety of crop failure and their dependence upon the divine favor to avert that. So the crop could fail by not getting enough rain. The crop can fail from getting too much rain. So they have sacrifices for that go all the way through April. Robigalia was held at the boundary of the Ager Romanus. Ferius Flaccus cites it in the grove, Lucas, at the fifth milestone from Rome along the Via Claudia. The celebration included the games Ludi and a sacrificial offering of the blood and entrails, of an unweaned puppy, or catulus. Now, do any of you know what a catulus is? We're told that's an unweaned, an unweaned puppy. In other words, a babe still at its mother, nursing from its mother's breast. Catulus. Have any of you ever heard of a catamite? You might. You might hear of a catamite and know what that is. Uh, they had a lot of interesting things back in ancient Rome and Greek in these time periods. So this sacrificial offering of the blood and, and, and entrails of an unweaned puppy just might, it just might be uh, changed a bit so it would have a slightly more PG rating for us. A slight something we could accept a little easier to kill one's beloved animal. And it's interesting, too, that in sacrifices, it is important that the sacrifice be loved for it to have more significance. It, it means little to give up something and sacrifice that you don't really care about. No, when you're, give, when you're asking a lot, you may have to give a lot, right? And we see that in the stories of, of uh, Lot and other characters who were uh, Job, let's say 
to where you give all. You give all if you want to live. That type of thing. Just depends upon the situation. But most animal sacrifice in the public region of ancient Rome resulted in a communal meal and thus involved domestic animals whose flesh was a normal part of the Roman diet. The dog occurs as a victim, most often in magic and private rites for Hecate and other Catholic deities, but was offered publicly at the Lupercalia and two other sacrifices pertaining to the grain crops. <clears throat> So the Robigalia was named for the god Robigus, who as the Numen, or the personification of agricultural disease, was also able to prevent it. He was thus a potentially malignant deity to be propitiated, as Aeolus Gellius notes. But the gender of the deity is elusive. The agricultural writer Columnella gives the name in the feminine as Robigo like the word used for a form of disease, the disease of wheat rust, wheat rust. So this is why we do sacrifice to rust. Do you understand? The rust has to do with the harvest and the disease on the wheat, which could destroy the harvest. Wheat leaf rust is a fungal disease that affects wheat, barley, rye stems, leaves, and grain. In temperate zones, it is destructive to the winter wheat. It is a pathogen, which has a reddish or reddish-brown color. Both Robigus and Robigo are also found as Rubig. Rubig. Big. Okay, any of you ever see a movie called Big? Remember that one with Tom Hanks? Well, you have your, your little gestation there, something to think about some of the meanings that may have been in that film. We're all big -o. Bigs. Right? So, uh, which following the etymology by association of antiquity was thought to be connected to the color red, as in ruber, or rubber, the ruber, a form of homeopathic or sympathetic magic. The color is thematic. The disease was red. The requisite puppies, sometimes bitches, had a red coat. The red of blood recalls the distinctively Roman incarnation of Mars as both a god of agriculture and bloodshed. Hmm. Mars. Mars, we know, the god of war and agricultural guardian combination characteristics of early Rome. He is the son of Jupiter and Juno and was preeminent among the Roman army's military gods, ruling as he does over a thought to rule as he does over uh, <clears throat> Scorpio, specifically in my point of view. But of course, Aries. Aries and Scorpio, right? A lot of these deities get two regions or two signs to rule over. Mars is one of the more powerful, so he's given two. Although I very often will uh, concede uh, Scorpio to be sharing this, uh, this uh, designation with Mars. Scorpio shares the designation with Mars and Pluto. The little planet Pluto out there. So, planetoid. Okay. So, um, he's a god of agriculture and bloodshed. So, of course, they would sacrifice to him. Now, Mars is known to be one of the malefics, along with Saturn. And these two work together. Okay, There's, they're part of uh, sort of like a, uh, I guess, a hot and cold collusion. William Ward Fowler, whose work on Roman festivals remains the standard reference, entertained the idea that Robicus is an indigitation of Mars. That is a name to be used in a prayer formula to fix the local action of the invoked god. In support of this idea, the priest who, presi who presided was the Flamen Quirinalis and the Ludi were held for both Mars and Robigo. 
the flamen recited a prayer that Ovid quotes at length in the Fasti, his six-book calendar poem on Roman holidays, which provides the most extended, thorough, problematic description of the day. Now, it's interesting that at this time, the Fasti Praea Nastini record that on the same day, the festival celebrated a particular class of sex workers, pimped out boys. Following the previous day's recognition of meretrices, female prostitutes regarded as professionals of some standing. Other April festivals related to farming were the Cerealia, or Festival of Ceres, lasting for several days in mid-month. The Fordicidia on April the 15th, when a pregnant cow was sacrificed. So that's an important one that I really want to get in my own mind, and, and uh, I suggest you do as well. The Fordicidia. Now, of course, I'm going to always think of President Ford myself, because I feel I have a connection to that particular uh, point in time in history and my own research. So... When I see anything about the Ford, I think of the fort, I think of the castle, and I think of uh, this sacrifice of a pregnant cow. Okay, so it, it's thought to be celebrated in April. So in my last video, I mentioned a bit about some of these things, particularly about uh, the rust, um, the um, rust sacrifice that happened on that set. On the movie set in New Mexico and that was in October I think it was October the 21st but uh, uh, the girl Halina who was uh, shot that day she was a uh, daughter of April April the 9th as I recall so it's interesting here and then of course we have the Perilia on April the 21st Perilia on April 21st to help to ensure the healthy healthy flocks. Now uh, this is interesting because we're talking about animal. We're taking a quick jump to animal husbandry here with the Perilia instead of just about crops. Right now we're talking about the animal foods, and Perilia just happens to be the birth date of uh, Queen Elizabeth II, and it will be her 98th birthday coming up on this April the 21st and it just also happens that it's the uh, that is the time that our comet Pons P. Brooks will reach its perihelion right its closest point to the earth no no excuse me it's closest point to the sun yeah it, it doesn't come closest to the earth until June the 2nd now June the 2nd was the queen's uh, coronation day so, of course, we've just come through a long corona ritual in this land. Much of the world, in fact, has gone through this long corona ritual. So it's interesting that we're going to be talking about a coronation on April the 21st and June the 2nd. I mean, the perihelion, perilia, and we have perilia, perihelion, on April the 21st for Comet Ponds P. Brooks. And then we have coronation on uh, on June the second. Perfectly perfect corollaries to Queen Elizabeth the second, which is why I had very long for a very long time called it the Queen's Comet. I called it the Queen's Comet Eclipse because April the twenty first is virtually the same date on the calendar to the April eighth date because April eighth is but the Julian version of April the 21st. Count down 13 days and you have April the 8th. So this April 21st date, I know a lot of us put a lot of importance and significance on that April 8th eclipse. And if you think it's over, you're wrong. Uh, it did seem to pass without too much, uh, too much uh, fanfare, too much, well, too much, uh, nothing untoward seems to have occurred other than the firing of the rockets and maybe a few small mishaps, you know. But uh, our real date that we need to look at here is April the 21st, I think. And, of course, the 22nd and the 23rd. 
So the 23rd being Passover. And I've made a video on that. You might look at it. Uh, I think it was called Sex, Sex, Sex. The God of the Passover. So, Perilia. And with all that other stuff I just listed, it's good for you to know that Perilia is also the celebration of the birth of Rome. April 21st is thought to be the birthday of the Roman Empire itself. What do you think of that? Romulus founded the, Ro founded the Roman Empire supposedly on April the 21st. So then we have the Vinalia, the wine festival from April the 23rd. So that's our Passover date, right? Yeah, that's going to be our Passover date this year. Fantastic, isn't it? Passover, and I just got done mentioning about Passover, what it means to me anyways, and my thoughts about it, and how there is a connection, in my mind, there's a connection to wine via Bacchus. The connection to Jesus that I implied within the video, uh, the, the uh, reference to Saturn, and uh, Saturn and Jesus, both. The old man on the mountain, or the old man in the sea, or the old, old father time. And then you have the young new year, as we've always been shown in the symbols. A baby, a baby of the new year, a brand new fresh year. And we all know of Saturn's uh, propensity to eat the years. He's the eater of time. Therefore, the apex predator. And it is he that eats the child of every new year. The years come and go right down his throat, right? The old man remains, you see. He sustains himself with another ring and another and another. Varro considered, considered these and the Robigalia, along with the great mothers, Megalensia, late in the month, now, this is where we get into some strangeness with the Mega and the Maga connections. But Megalensia, Megalesia, or the Megalenses, Ludi, a festival celebrated in ancient Rome from April 4th to April 10th in honor of Cybele, known to Romans as the Magna Mater. The name of the festival derives from the Greek, Greek Megale, meaning the Great. Mega, Maga, means great. Make America great again? Do you understand what's being said in that? It's more than a political slogan because America, or Americus, is the considered the deity herself. A feminine appellation for this place, for this North American continent, America, both North and South, the Americas, right? Americas, Americas. Hmm. Do you see? So MAGA, great. Great. Make her great again, as though she could somehow be less than great based upon our behavior. I don't think so. She is great. This nation, the, not the nation, excuse me, the land is great and magnificent. And the, the term MAGA is just. And MEGA, it, it, we're talking about magic here. We're talking about magi. These are root words that also connect to magi. So all of these uh, festivals that they're having here with the sex workers, male and female prostitutes, and all these things, the sacrifice of the pregnant cow, Right, the wine festival, the Bacchus festival, these are all fertility. These are all about fertility. And this great mother, who we refer to within the Christian churches as the, the great whore of Babylon, here she is. You're, if you're here in America, you're, you're right here. Cybele, the Anatolian mother goddess. She may have a possible forerunner in the earliest Neolithic at Catalhoic. Cattle. Another very interesting thing. She's called Cattle Kate in some variations. Every time you see the references to Texas and the Cattle Barons 
and all everything that has to do with the cows and the bulls and the cattle, you're having a reference there. There's a reference that directly points to Taurus. Okay. Taurus is in April. And that's where we're talking about here. April the 23rd, we have entered into Taurus at that time. You see, so the whole month of April is dedicated to this stuff. The bulls, the cows, and the sacrifices, along with all the sex. So Robigalia has been connected to the Christian Feast of Rogation, which we have been told... Rogation days are days of prayer and fasting in Western Christianity. They are observed with processions in the litanies of the saints. The so-called major rogation is held on the 25th of April. 25th is, a, is an important date. Whichever month, 25th of August, 25th of April. When you see that 25, you're talking about some sort of a sacrifice date. All these other dates as well, but just remember the 25 if you can. So, uh, these rogations were held Monday to Wednesday preceding Ascension Thursday, the Feast of the Ascension of Jesus Christ, where he was taken bodily into heaven, perhaps when he was sacrificed. It just depends on how you may choose to look at these things. The word rogation comes from the Latin verb rogare, to ask, to ask, hmm, which reflects the beseeching of God for appeasement of his anger and for protection. So the begging, begging for protection. Rogation Sunday is celebrated on the fifth Sunday after Easter. Rogate. So where did this come from even here? The Christian major rogation replaced the pagan Roman procession known as Robigalia, at which time a dog was sacrificed to propitiate Robigus, the deity of agricultural disease. The practitioners observing Robigalia asked Robigus for protection of their crops from the wheat rust. Again, the rust connecting us again and again, pointing our eyes back toward that, what happened on that rust set with Alec Baldwin and Helena Hutchins. Hutchins, they tell us. Well, Holly, Haley, Halina. What do you think about that? We have a Haley type comet in the sky right now. It seems that it was known it was going to be coming at this time. So all the major players who are into these deep religious sky gods, such as a comet, such as Haley's comet was worshipped by them when it was here in 1986 and before that was it 1910 and uh, yes now we have another Haley type comet in the sky and in preparation there were sacrifices and probably ongoing so it pretty much gets us here gets us here that uh, some, it finishes this up. So, uh, Barrow considered these in Robigalia along with the great mother's Megalensia, but the Robigalia has been connected to the Christian feast of Rogation, which was concerned with purifying and blessing the parish and the fields, at which took place, took the place of the Robigalia on April 25th of the Christian calendar. The church father to Tertullian, notice he's a father, Tertullian mocks the goddess Robigo as having been made up of fiction. Well, what an interesting thing to have the uh, patriarchy deny the existence of the goddess even on the days where they celebrate the goddess. Isn't that interesting to note? Well, I guess we have the very same thing happening in Islam and we have the very same thing in Christianity and in uh in uh, uh, Hebrew, right? The Jews do the same thing. So, okay. So now we've talked about that. I wanted to talk just briefly about 
the uh, my feelings about the green being potentially connected to the green man, as I said. And um, the, there's something about this, you know, the green man is a tree, is essentially a tree. He's hidden in the trees, right? Here it is, foliate head in the shape of an acanthus leaf. A corbel supporting the Bamberg horseman at the Bamberg Cathedral in Germany from the 13th century. Now we see often that his, his face and his beard and hair are greenery. This is from the Byzantine mosaic in the Great Palace Mosaic Museum in Istanbul. Hungary? No thanks, I just had a falafel. <laughs> Remember that line by John Candy? Istanbul, Hungary, yes. The bull, the tan man, the tanner, the tannin. Istan, Istanbul. Here he is again in the ruins of Hatra in Iraq from the second century. The Pinel Gwynedd, one of the few examples on stained glass church windows. The green man. Could this green man be representative of Saturn? Why do I ask? Because Saturn has an interesting designation as a sky god and an earth deity. But why, John? Why would you say that Saturn is an earth deity? Well, Saturn is the ruler of Capricorn, cardinal earth. That's why. And also the ruler of, uh, of uh, Aquarius, right? Air. So the sky and the earth. Do you see? Earth and sky. So a tree has its roots deep within the earth. And it's the tree has its roots going deep within the earth and its branches re reaching high into the sky. So how else, if you were a druid, how else would you communicate with the green man? How else would you communicate with Saturn if not via the trees? The trees are the thing. The druided, the druidian masters, you might say, the teachers. He appears all over the world. Now, it puts me in mind that how you see the images of Saturn as an old man the old man, the ancient of days, the uh, the old one. And we see him as uh, eating a child, right? Eating or perhaps disgorging. And we also see images of a serpent. If you just look up the serpents of America, the deities of this continent, you may see uh, somebody named, let's see here, Quetzalcoatl. And Quetzalcoatl, aside from the serpent forms, is often shown disgorging something from the mouth as though it had swallowed or consumed a man and was disgorging him. The serpent Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. Here's one of those images I was referring to. So, the gorging one, he gorges himself upon the years. Hmm? Reminds me of an old song. Gathering up the years. Remember that old song? Are you gathering up the tears? Are you reeling in the years, stowing away the time? Gathering up the tears. Have you had enough of mine? Remember that? Well, it's something along the lines of Saturn. 
is what I think is being talked about in that song. I've often thought that it means that one enters into the wave of time. Saturn being the Time Lord, right? Kronos. And entering the wave, the sine wave, the sine wave of sin, because Saturn is thought to be m malefic, okay? The sine wave. And it takes you on a journey through all the levels of hells, all the hells that can be. There's pleasures and there's pain. And there's plenty of tears along the way. And disgorges you from its other head on the other end, somewhere else, from its tail. Right? Almost it could uh, swallow you at the North Pole and deposit you at the South Pole by the time it's done with you. So Quetzalcoatl comes from the Nahuatl language, meaning precious serpent. Quetzal, the feathered serpent. And, but the Nahuatl people wrote Quetzalcoatl in its literal sense means serpent of precious feathers, but in its allegorical sense, the wisest of men. So I also like to look at... Um, this guy here. Kukulkan. And I know that probably a small percentage of you, you will realize that this is where you get the concept, not the concepts we've been given and we've been fed about the meanings of these groups, all these esoteric groups that play dress up, right? And they like to dress up as wizards with pointy hats. You know who I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah, the clan, right? The one in the white pointy hats. And uh, I talk often about that. The video, um, the music, the musical number, O oh, Hi O, oh, from uh, O oh, Brother, Where Art Thou? And that particular little segment where the men are dressed in their white hats, prancing around the fire, dancing, chanting, oh hi, oh hi, oh hi, oh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and all that. Yes, they clearly showed us racial overtones within that uh, segment. You've got George Clooney and the other guy, the other two soggy bottom boys standing, watching in horror as by in the firelight as they see their friend who made some sort of a deal at the crossroads, uh, being led to be, it looks as though he's going to be lynched or burned or something and sacrificed there. So they step in and save him, right? Now, if that film wasn't too offensive and it wasn't censored or, or not, it, it was allowed to exist, why should we not be allowed to talk about the film? Does that mean we're, if we talk about that scene in the film, does that mean we're glorifying racism? That's apparently, you, you have to, you have to actually be afraid that that's what they're going to say you are. You're a racist if you talk about that. That's preposterous. How would we ever make progress against racism if we didn't see things like that and try to understand what they're saying? What if they're not saying as simply as what they want us to think that, oh, over here you have the bad guys and over here you have the good guys. If you're a liberal, that means you're against it. And if you're a conservative, that means you're for slavery or something. When it was just quite the opposite during the time of the Civil War, wasn't it? The Republicans and the Democrats were reversed. How do you account for that? A polar shift? I guess it doesn't matter if you think you if you identify so clearly with one of those two choices and you've limited yourself to that then you don't need to know any further all you need to do is react just be reactive just react and show off uh, your uh, moral superiority and move on I guess maybe that will do something somehow some good for someone I don't know 
but it is a shame that I can't post that 30 second video without being accused of hate speech. I didn't even say a word on it. All I did was post, repost 30 seconds from the Ohio part of that film and that scene, which does clearly show clan members prancing about. Then you have the Grand Dragon standing up singing the song, O oh Death. And who do you suppose they're speaking to? Here on American soil, who do you think they're referencing? Saturn is the old man, old father time. And who then is Kukul Khan representing? Quetzalcoatl, the plumed serpent. Why do you suppose they've named themselves the KKK? 11, 11, 11. It's not purely based upon hatred, my friends. There's a whole lot more to it than that. So, the serpent de deity of Maya mythology, closely related to the deity Kuk Umats of the Quiche people and to Quetzalcoatl of the Aztecs. The prominent temples to Kukul Khan are found at the archaeological sites in Yucatan Peninsula, such as Chichen Itza, Uxmal, and Maya Pan. Maya and Pan. The depiction of the feathered serpent is present in other cultures of Mesoamerica. Although heavily Mexicanized, Kukul Khan has its origins among the Maya of the classic period. Maya Pan. Maya Pan, right? Little is known. Nevertheless, little is known of the mythology of this pre-Columbian era deity. So, yeah. Kukul is feathered, com combined with Can, the snake. Zotzilchon, giving a literal meaning of feathered snake. Kukulkan is Kukulchon in Kiorti. Kukulkan is Kukurkon. Kukurkon. Khan. You ever wonder why they named character like uh, that Star Trek character Khan? Or all the different Khans of the ancient empires of the Mongol hordes. Kubla Khan. All these different uh, characters. How did they get this name? Their ruler is named the Khan. Hmm. And don't Khans rule the prisons too, don't they? The Khans. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Kukul Khan has its origins among the Maya of the classic period when it was known as the Waxaklahun Uba Khan. Waxaklahun. Waxa clan, waxa clan uba khan, wax on, wax off. <laughs> the war serpent. It has been identified also as the post classic version of the vision serpent of classic Maya art. So, who are you connecting with, my friends, when you get that ayahuasca in you? Do you think maybe this could be one of the entities that you're going to be interacting with? Do you think they just made all this stuff up, this intricate imagery, and built these pyramids based upon, hey, I have an idea for a great story. Let's just uh, create an entire cultural foundation based upon these mythos without anything to do uh, with reality? No, these same type of pyramids appeared all over the earth. Same type of pyramids. So... Kukul Khan was a deity closely associated with the Itza state in the northern Yucatan Peninsula. The Tan. Oh, I can't help but thinking of uh, Biff Tannen and the Tan Man when I think of the, whenever I come across these. When the religion formed the core of the territorial region, the territorial religion, although the worship of Kukul Khan had its origins in earlier Maya traditions, the the Itza worship of Kukul Khan was influenced by Quetzalcoatl of Mexico. This influence probably arrived at 
via Putun Maya, the merchants from the Gulf Coast of Mexico. So you see how important that Gulf Coast is to everything. We're talking about a sacred area of our continent when we talk about the Gulf, the Gulf Coast. When you think of the Gulf Coast, I know we think only of the area that's underneath, you know, underneath the feet of uh, the man standing right there in the center of America, right? The, the, uh, standing in the center of North America. His foot is Louisiana and his head is Minnesota. And he is a full-on representation of the ancient deity, the ancient Egyptian deity of Amun-Min. And if you just take a look at the middle of the map, of any U.S. map, and as long as you can see the states drawn in, you should be able to see him there. Although I have not yet heard anybody echo it in any videos. But you can watch a bunch of my videos about that if you like. Or you can just look for yourself and know that it's true. These Chantal merchants probably actively promoted the feathered serpent worship throughout Mesoamerica. Kukulkan headed a whole pantheon of deities of mixed Maya and non-Maya provenance and used to promote the Itza political and commercial agendas. It also eased the passage of Itza merchants into central Mexico and other non-Maya areas promoting the Itza economy. At Chichen Itza, Kukul Khan ceased to be the vision serpent that served as messenger between king and the gods and came instead to symbolize the divinity of the entire territory. El Castillo, the castle, the temple of Kukul Khan, served as, yes, El Castillo, Chichen Itza, served as a temple to Kukul Khan. Now, somehow you have interaction here. You have connection to the chessboard. Now, I haven't got it all figured out. But if you look at these, these connections within these esoteric, uh, these esoteric organizations that always show you the chessboard. And then they have their ladders and various pillars and whatnot. But you have these castles on the chessboard on the 64 square chessboard, representing what? What does the 64 represent, if not the cube? Right? So you have something here like a cube. And to my mind, a castle is a good name for it because it's a clearly a pyramid, but it's a castle. Hmm. So the power piece on the chessboard is the queen. And that's one thing that I like about those, uh, those Freemasons. They represent that, and that's by simply doing that, they've gone far, far, they've gone way farther than any of the churches and monotheist churches. They truly represent something that's pagan, although most of them don't know it. So... <clears throat> I think I'll I'll leave it with that when it comes to Kukul Khan. I've said enough on that stuff. And I'm pretty much going to wind up here. I did want to talk about the rays, but I don't think I have time right now. The seven rays, and uh, I want to mention how Saturn is uh, the governor of one of these rays. And that would be like the green man is then governing the green ray. Now, when I saw the monolith from the from two thousand one space od a space odyssey, uh, I think a lot of people recognize that that has to do with Saturn, don't they? That black cube, it's it's shown as a monolith, but it's also uh, part of this symbolically is a cube, and uh, the monoliths around the world often are phallic, right? They're generally speaking phallic. You get an Eiffel of the Eiffel Tower. It's not a traditional monolith. It's a man-made, but nevertheless, you have a, a phallic tower, an obelisk. And the obelisk represents the pyramid. And there, at the base, there is the representation of the cube. You have the four sides. It's a four-sided base stretching up. And as Persian Magi will explain... 
stretching up to the point at the top where we would think that the point at the top is, this is a phallus, right? You'd think that the point at the top is merely just the aspect of the penis. However, it is explained that in ancient times, the concept is somewhat different. The four sides of the pyramid, the four corners, represent the male devil deities. And at the top is the, fe the female, the divine feminine. So they would call her perhaps Ishtar, Isis, whatever you choose to call her. She has many names, Sibyl, whatever it is, the feminine principle sitting at the top of the tower. Now, if you saw the I Pet Goat video and you wondered in your mind, why is that old lady in the top of the phallic tower uh, just before the explosion of the orgasm occurs and you notice that she ovulates or she, uh, yeah, she seems to become fertile suddenly just before it happens. And this is very interesting because it was confusing to me. But when you see the woman on the top of the tower, as you did with King Kong and all these types of themes where they always do this, it's a, it's a huge male with a, with a small woman at the top of the tower, right? Somehow or another, there's a rep, that representation uh, in, within the phallus, within the phallic. And it's more, it may be more or less that the, the goddess like Isis is flying over and she becomes fertilized. But if you want to attract the divine feminine, you need to erect this is the concept. The erect, the erected monument, <laughs> the erected obelisk will draw her to you. So, yeah, I wanted to mention about obelisks there. And that includes latte stones. The latte stones should be mentioned. They don't get much mentioned because they're strictly in the, uh, in the Pacific Islands, the Mariana Islands, although they're represented, as far as I'm concerned, to the Easter Island um, hat figures that we see there. These are monoliths with a big head on top. They're phallic, undoubtedly. And they used to build lodges, and they would be sex lodges on top of them, essentially houses of prostitution. So they're quite enormous, and at other parts of the, and other parts just slightly beyond the these islands, you would of course see the Philippines and um, other areas of Asia and Micronesia, and all these locations where they have all sorts of evidence of uh, monoliths that are straight up carved as penises so that gives us an idea of what we're talking about here and it's a lot less mysterious than the locals would have us believe or you know everybody wants to water everything down don't they so it occurred to me that uh, america is tiamat now whether that's true or not that's how i choose to see it i see the americas as the great goddess tiamat the whore of babylon the seven-headed dragon Okay, however you want to look at that. And when I think of the seven rays, as I mentioned, here's, a, here's an example of a seven-headed dragon. The Shisha, the Nagdevta. Some pretty cool imagery. There's thought to be, and they even look like fish, fish heads, don't they? And of course you have seven Nagas, and you have seven sages, and you have seven Apkalu fish, the seven wisest beings in the universe, thought to be. It's just so cool. And now I want to mention here the seven rays. It's just exhaust these images real quick and then we'll move on seven-headed naga the heads of shisha <laughs> narasimha the man-lion incarnation of vishnu seated on the coils of shisha 
with seven heads of shisha forming a canopy. Amazing. This guy is just hilarious looking to me. I think that's so cool. And we're more probably more familiar with these images. But now we're going to move on. And my final little end of the chat here should be right here about the seven rays. And basically, it's it has to do with theosophy. And uh, seven rays is a concept that appeared in several religions and esoteric philosophies in both Western and Western culture and in India since at least the 6th century BCE. In Occidental culture, it can be seen in early Western mystery traditions such as Gnosticism and Mithraism. And in texts and iconic art of, Cath of the Catholic Church as early as the Byzantine Empire. In India, the concept has been part of Hindu religious philosophy and scripture since at least the Vishu, Vishnu Purana, dating from the post-Vedic era. Beginning in the late 19th century, the seven rays appeared in a modified and elaborated form in the teachings of theosophy, first presented by Helena Blavatsky. The theosophical concept of the seven rays was further developed in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in the writings of theosophist Charles Webster Ledbetter <clears throat> and by other authors such as Alice Bailey, Manley P. Hall, and others, notably including the teachings of Benjamin Krim and his group, Share International, as well as the philosophies of organization, organizations such as the Temple of the People, I Am Activity, the Bridges to Freedom, the Summit Lighthouse, the Temple of the Presence, and various other organizations promulgating Ascended Master teachings, a group of religious teachings based on theosophy. As the New Age movement of the mid to late 20th century developed, the Seven Rays concept appeared as an element of metaphysical healing methods such as Reiki and other modalities and in esoteric astrology. Now, in ancient Greek mythology, Zeus takes the bull form known as Taurus in order to win Europa. I always focus on Taurus these days. So, Taurus is also associated with Aphrodite and Venus and April, of all things, April, Evril, open, the open door. So, Taurus is associated with Aphrodite and other goddesses, as well as with Pan. So, we have the association to both the feminine and the male, the penis and the vagina, when we speak of this, right? The yoni and the lingam, Shiva lingam, and Dionysus, and therefore Bacchus and Dionysus, Genesis, John and Isis. The genesis of life, the penis and the vagina, the, the wine and the bread, right? The face of Taurus gleams with seven rays of fire. How perfect is that? Hmm? The face of Taurus gleams with the seven rays of fire. The Chaldean oracles of the 2nd century AD feature the seven rays as purifying agents of Helios. Symbolism featured in the Mithraic liturgy as well. Later in the 4th century, Emperor Julian Saturnalia composed a hymn to the solemn sun and in his hymn to the mother of the gods spoke of unspeakable mysteries hidden from the crowd, such as Julian the Chaldean prophesied concerning the god of the seven rays. In Greek Gnostic magic of the same era, colored gemstones were often used as talismans for medicine or healing. They were often engraved with a symbol borrowed from the Egyptian deity Knupus, Knufus, a hooded serpent or a great snake. Knufus. Canufus, it's interesting, the canoe sound. Canoe, I see a lot of references to a canoe very often, don't you? When you're looking in mythology. A hooded serpent or a great snake. The snake was shown with a lion's head from which emanated either 12 or 7 rays. The 12 rays represented the zodiac 
The seven rays represented the seven planets, usually with the seven Greek vowels engraved at the tips of the seven rays. Now this is so amazing because when you think about the Greek vowels, think about our vowels here in English or whatever languages you speak. Just consider the vowels that you learned as a child. A-E-I-O-U and sometimes Y and sometimes W you might hear nowadays, right? When I was a kid, it was just A-E-I-O-U and sometimes Y. A-E-I-O-U. Hmm. It reminds me of the E-I-E-I-O of Ronald McDonald and uh, E-I-E-I-O that was being sung on, uh, on uh, that song that I mentioned earlier, I Know Brother Where Art Thou? by the Ku Klux Khan worshippers with their pointy white hats. So, yeah, and of course, I meant to say, uh, you know, the old song, Old MacDonald Had a Farm, E-I-E-I-O, implying that this is a farm. Here we are on earth, living on a farm. And if you're a farmer, you're planting the seed and you're raising up children, right? That's one way of looking at this stuff, because I know that's how they look at it. If you wonder, if you ever wondered what's so cool about or interesting about that old show, Green Acres, have another look at it. Try to understand what's going on there, because there's nothing too fun or interesting about planting grains. But that's not what was going on in that show, not really. So there's a reason that our MAGA president was uh, singing that song publicly. Uh, that song being... Uh, Oh, geez, I can't remember how it goes just now. You'll have to look it up. Green Acres. Green Acres is the place to be. That's right. So anyway, um, the, rever the uh, seven Greek vowels engraved at the tips of the seven rays and the reverse sides of the talismans were engraved with a snake twisting around a vertical rod. So what do we think that means? The electrical rod with the snake twisting around it. Would you say that snake could be electrical current, perhaps? Could that snake be the electricity that is formed from the union of male and female when that rod is touched and uh, stimulated? And, uh, you know, the union of the lingam and the yoni, perhaps? That's kind of how I view it. So these were known as Gnostic amulets. In my last video, I showed the amulets worn by Greeks and Romans of certain time. They were straight up phallic images of the phallus. And they would uh, touch them or kiss them for good luck. Everybody wore them, including children. They were all over the place. So these snakes twisting around the vertical rod seemed to me like a, just a subtle way of saying the same thing. These Gnostic amulets were sometimes also engraved with the names Io Sabeo, the Archon Io. Gnostic gems with Abraxas also featured the seven rays. I have friends who just love Abraxas. So, Abra, Abra, Abraxas, Abrahim. It definitely reminds me of Abraham in Abraham in this, Abraxas. So we're talking also about the vowels of the alphabet. You know, I always think of these things when I think of abracadabra and what it's being said there and how you can play with the alphabet and the letters of the alphabet to, uh, f to uh, try to form words. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, try to form words from it. Try to find out if there's a hidden message in your 26 letter alphabet, if you can. I've gotten... Uh, three quarters of the way through the alphabet, but I haven't finished it exactly. So, in Catholicism, early Christian iconography, the dove of the Holy Ghost is shown with an emanation of seven rays, as is the image of the Madonna, often in conjunction with a dove or doves. And some of us may have seen the images of the seven-rayed or seven-tailed comet. When I spoke of the comet, Pons Brooks, you can take a look at some of the 
the comets of the past and Halley's Comet in the past and find out that they had many of them with more, more than one tail. So consider that. The Monastery of St. Catherine on Mount Sinai, uh, someplace I'd love to go one day, circa 565 shows the transfiguration of Christ in the apse mosaic with seven rays of light shining from the luminous body of Christ above the apostles Peter, James, and John. So we have again a, re a relationship of the seven to Christ and in my way of thinking, Christ also to Saturn and Father Time. In the present day Byzantine style St. Louis Cathedral in Missouri. Ooh, isn't Missouri something along the lines of the Freemason capital? The center of the sanctuary has an engraved circle with many symbols of the Holy Trinity. The inscription reads, radiating from this symbol are seven rays of light representing the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost. During the 12th century, St. Norbert of Xanten, founder of the Order of Canons Regular of Premontre, discovered the spot where the relics of St. Ursula and her companions of St. Gerion and other martyrs lay hidden while in a dream. In the dream that led him to this location, he was guided by the seven rays of light surrounding the head of the crucified Redeemer. It appears in, hit, in I'm going to skip over some of this. Uh, I should mention the Knights of the Apocalypse, however. The secret society, the Knights of the Apocalypse, was founded with the professed aim to defend the Catholic Church against the expected Antichrist. Although it was accused of having political motives, they wore upon their breasts a star with seven rays. In uh, Hinduism, Agni was a Hindu and Vedic deity depicted in three forms, fire, lightning, and sun. <clears throat> Agni is depicted with two or seven hands, two legs, or two heads, and three legs. On each head, he has seven fiery tongues with which he licks sacrificial butter. <laughs> Very cool and interesting, right? Wow. <clears throat> so, there's a whole lot more, and I'm only at the top here. I think I'm going to cut it off right there for tonight because it's getting late. But I'll take it up and finish for those who might be interested. I'll begin here at the synchristic syncretistic interpretations and continue on with the seven rays and try to bring it back as I intended from the start not really knowing exactly where I was going in the beginning of this but intending to bring the discussion back to um, Saturn ultimately and Saturn image my thinking of Saturn as the green man in this and representative of the obelisk and uh, as I said, um, the old man on the mountain, the, uh, the great and ancient one, Father Time, right? The cruel teacher, um, the one who demands honesty. So I'll leave it with that, and I hope to see you again next time, my friends. Thank you for listening. Please like and comment. Give, some, uh, give me some of your thoughts if you have some. I don't mind if you disagree. I'd love to hear it. I'd just like to hear some human response. And uh, uh, hopefully that'll encourage me to continue. Thank you so much. See you then.